Good morning everyone. Last week we looked at verses just before the ones that we just heard read where Mark recorded the death of Jesus on the cross and they were an astonishing three hours. We heard of Jesus' cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 2 and the agony that he experienced there. We saw uh, the darkness that descended upon the land for three hours, symbolising that sense of judgment and separation that fell on Jesus instead upon us. We saw that the curtain which divided the Holy of Holies and God's presence from his people torn in two as the way was opened for us to have access to God one to one, face to face. And of course, we saw the confession of the Roman centurion who, watching the way that Jesus died, said, surely this man was the son of God. Well, now the camera pans back, if you like, from the cross to cover the crowd. And there at the back of the crowd are a group of women and the group of women are followers of Jesus. Mark tells us that they've been accompanying Jesus uh, along with the rest of the disciples and helping take care of his needs. And now we see that they are present at his execution, eyewitnesses that he was now dead. Why are, the back of, why are they at the back of the crowd? I've seen a few different theories on this and nobody really knows. Uh, one is that it might have been a, in a sense of modesty because it wasn't unusual for people to be crucified naked. Uh, another person, a man, suggests that it was because they were fearful and so they hung back for fear of themselves being arrested or associated too closely with Jesus, to which you might be tempted to reply, well, OK, fella, but at least they were there. Where are the disciples? We can't see them anywhere here, can we? And uh, one writer puts it this way, for all the disciples' promises, it was the women that saw it through. We know three of their names, um, Mary Magdalene. You've got Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. And the implication seems to be for the early church, Mark, as he describes this, is look, these, these people were eyewitnesses. If you want to check this further, if you want to verify this account, then just go and talk to them. And it's another example of, of God using witnesses that just seem very unusual to us to confirm the gospel accounts of who Jesus is. It starts, doesn't it, with the shepherds who were a rough bunch with a really dodgy reputation uh, being the ones that the, the birth of Jesus is announced to right at the beginning. He uses John the Baptist to announce who Jesus is. And let's face it, much as it pains us as Baptists to admit this, John the Baptist was a little bit eccentric, wasn't he? And then you've got a man who once lived as a lunatic, an uncontrollable man who lived uh, in a graveyard, once he's healed by Jesus, being sent to proclaim the gospel of who Jesus is uh, for the very first time. You have a small child offered as an example of faith, and so the list goes on. And here we have a group of women who are charged with being eyewitnesses or in the position of being eyewitnesses at Jesus's crucifixion. And a few verses on, we will read that they, uh, two of them at least, were present at the burial as well. And why are they unusual witnesses? Well, because back then, women were not considered reliable witnesses. You couldn't testify as a woman in a court of law. And hopefully that seems really strange to our ears, but that was the way it was back then. And so the fact that Mark says, look, these women were there, they saw it happen, and some of them saw the burial, and later on we'll find out they experienced and witnessed other things as well. And so, you know, the fact that he makes such a big deal of that makes me think it's more likely that this is a reliable account. Because frankly, if you were making this stuff and wanted people to believe something that wasn't quite true, you'd have just chosen male witnesses or witnesses with some more authority, people you might be more inclined to trust. We can't imagine how the women must have felt. They've invested so much in Jesus. They have 
followed him, they have heard him speak, they have seen the deeds he's done, they've, they've seen his character and surely came to the same conclusion as the centurion, surely this man was the son of God. Emotionally uh, they have just so much invested in this man, here's a man who they found their identity in rather than the way that society saw them and now it's all over must have felt that way. Roman law said that criminals forfeit any kind of right that they had to a proper burial and it wasn't unusual for them to leave the bodies of criminals crucified up on the cross as a warning to people uh, as they went about their everyday business that this is what happens when you cross the Roman Empire. And so you've got this situation where wild birds and carrion birds and, and wild dogs and other animals would take care of the corpses. One theory of why Golgotha was the place of the skull is that there were so many skulls lying littered around there. But in verse 43 we're introduced to Joseph of Arimathea, somebody who makes sure that that doesn't happen to Jesus. Now luckily for you I'm something of an authority on Joseph of Arimathea even if that makes me sound a little bit like Daddy Pig in the Peppa Pig stories for those of you with children who know such things. In Burnham on Sea, where we used to live, about a mile from our house uh, and on the road that my wife drove every day on the way to school, there's a plaque telling you about Joseph of Arimathea and it reads, Joseph of Arimathea, according to legend, is said to have landed near here on his way to Glastonbury and called the place Paradise. Now if you've ever been to Burnham-on-Sea you might just have reason to doubt this legend. And I have many fond memories of living in Burnham-on-Sea for 12-13 years, uh, mainly of the people but also of the place. Uh, the beach which was a wonderful place to go and walk and in fact I confess at this time of self-isolation it'd be really nice to be able to just walk along the beach. Uh, but there were all sorts of events that went on in town as well and there was quite a little kind of thriving community and culture there. Uh, but Paradise, I think even the keenest Burn on sea resident would struggle to think of it as heaven on earth. Well to the point the accounts that the Gospels give us are much more historically accurate and reliable. Mark doesn't give us that much detail, it's characteristic of his gospel, he kind of gives us the highlights and keeps moving on. Uh, the other three though help us to fill us in a little bit on Joseph of Arimathea. Luke chapter 23 verses 50 and 51 tell us, Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Then Matthew chapter 27 verses 57 through to 61 tell us, As evening approached there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate he asked for Jesus' body and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. And finally John chapter 19 tells us in verse 38, later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. The one unique factor that Mark tells us, and he's the only one who tells us this, is that Joseph's actions were bold. He boldly went and asked Pilate for the body. Well, why is he bold? He had the guts to go and ask for it. It was usually something burying the body of a criminal that family would do or maybe close family friends but we've got no record of them doing that in this occasion. The tomb is instead, uh, Jesus's tomb is 
one provided, as we just had read, by Joseph of Arimathea. It was his own one and it would have been an expensive piece of property for him. So he is giving up his own tomb in order to see Jesus buried there. He wasn't to know at the time that this was only going to be a two night booking, of course. Also, his reputation would have been seriously damaged. Here is a prominent Jew, a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council in Jerusalem. And by doing this, he's identifying himself with Jesus. I don't know about you, but I think the following meeting of the Sanhedrin, which would have been the next uh, day, which wasn't a, a Sabbath or a, or a holy day, uh, would have been really interesting. You'd like to have been a fly on the wall of it. Somebody said, so Joseph, I hear you buried the heretic in your own tomb. Would have raised some eyebrows, wouldn't that? And in doing this, of course, he's also richly unclean. He's not able to go to church tomorrow. And so in the words of Tom Wright, he was uh, prepared to face uncleanness, suspicion and possible charges as an associate of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea steps up and in doing so associates himself with Jesus. In a crisis, he was ready to rise to the occasion and publicly identify himself as a believer in Christ. He was bold. And then everything's a race against time. Jesus died on the cross at 3 p.m. According to custom, the new day, the Sabbath, would begin at sundown in three hours' time. He has to go from Golgotha to Pilate's headquarters uh, in order to get permission. He needs to buy a shroud either on the way or on the way back. He needs to collect the body. He needs to have the body washed and to bury Jesus all in three hours, probably with the help of servants. Then uh, he does, he starts this and then imagine the frustration and the panic that he must feel as he goes to Pilate and he's kept waiting by Pilate because Pilate wants to check that Jesus really is dead because he's died really quickly. So he wants it verified. And so a message goes to the centurion back at Golgotha for him to come back and confirm that Jesus is definitely dead. And he does that, which gives us further evidence Jesus really did die on the cross, contrary to what some people claim. The executioner in charge of the crucifixion, who we heard last week exclaiming, this man surely is the son of God, confirms that Jesus was indeed surely dead. At which point the body is released to Joseph and presumably, as we say with help, he gets all this done in time, finishing by rolling a large stone across the entrance, which would be set in a groove uh, and be pointing downhill to make it easy to close, uh, but very hard to open. And we read there that two of the people we were introduced to in verse 40, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, were there as witnesses to the fact that he was also buried. So that's it. The end of the story. The end of Jesus. Or is it? Well, I spoiled The Wizard of Oz for some of you last week, so I don't really want to spoil next week's, but do make sure you don't miss it, because there's a bit of a twist. And that is probably the biggest understatement of my lifetime. Before I finish, I just want to pose a couple of questions about this section. Firstly, if we're followers of Jesus, how bold are we? And that's bold with an O, I'm not talking about being hairless. Joseph of Arimathea is described in John's Gospel as a secret believer for fear of the Jewish leaders. And I wonder if we can identify with that on any kind of level. Are we people who tend to keep quiet about how important Jesus is to us? because we're fearful of what people around us might make of us. Whether it could jeopardise a friendship, whether we could get teased for it, maybe we could be shunned socially because of that. Well, when push come to shove, all credit, Joseph Arimathea stepped up, decided he didn't give a stuff what other people thought about him. He was going to identify with Jesus. Now, maybe that's a challenge to us. And then secondly, last week we saw the centurion put his faith in Jesus. This week we see 
Joseph of Arimathea really nailing his colours to the mast about what he thought publicly about Jesus. And both of them in different ways are unlikely converts. Both, it seems, have their actions triggered by what they see at the cross. What about us? As we survey the wondrous cross, what's our reaction? And at the beginning of Holy Week or Easter Week, it's good for us to be reflecting on that question.